Thanks for joining us today. Our hope is that you're greatly encouraged by today's message and inspired to saturate our city and world with God's heart. For all the picnics today, the trips to the zoo, hanging out with family and friends, the day off work tomorrow, the traveling, vacations, all those things. We thank you for those things, but God, we thank you for the lives that were lost. Sacrifices were made, God, that we might have freedom in our country. God, amongst all the th great things we're going to be doing this weekend, God, let us not forget that. God, we pray comfort for the families who lost loved ones. God, that their hearts would be comforted with the comfort that comes from you. And that, God, as we have an opportunity to comfort them, that we would do it as well. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would ask uh, parents uh, that you take the opportunity to, sh to share with our young ones, our children, what today is all about. It's, there's a lot of things happening, you know, with graduations and schools out and vacation beginning. And, and as many people think that Memorial Day is the beginning of summer, you know, beginning of vacation season, let's not miss out telling them about the sacrifices that were made for our country. Thank you so much if you would uh, remember to do that. Amen? Amen. Well, this morning, I want to uh, announce something to you. We've been promoting it in our video announcements for the back past two or three weeks, but uh, this is my first time having an opportunity to share about it, is in August, August the 10th and 11th, we will be hosting the Global Leadership Summit right here at Bellevue Christian Center. Yep. And for those of you who say, well, well what is it all about? Uh, there's a church called Willow Tr Creek in Chicago. Bill Hybels had a vision that the church would be the church. And too often when it came to our leadership and our influence as a church, we didn't take it seriously. So Bill's heart was that the church would be this organized organism that could affect its community in such a way that because of our leadership, and if you prefer our influence, because we took our influence seriously, we would begin to develop our influence so that in our schools, in our law enforcement, in our government, in our homes as fathers and mothers, as employees and employers, our influence would make a difference for the kingdom of God. Over the past 10 or so years, we've been involved. Uh, I've been involved since the 90s when it started, back in 94, 95, because I believe that the church, the church, the church is the hope of the world. I believe that Bellevue Christian Center, along with all the local churches, we should have an effect upon our communities in such a way that every community, Bellevue, Nebraska, would say, man, thank God that Bellevue Christian Center is here. And one of the ways that we do that is by developing ourselves as leaders and influencers in our community. So if that's something that you want to take serious in your discipleship, in your growth, you don't have to have a position, you don't have to have a title, you can just be a believer and come to this conference and you will be equipped. I am so blessed because this quality of conference costs hundreds of dollars. And because we're hosting it, we get it for $89 a person. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see one of these flyers. It'll show you all the speakers as well as uh, omahaleaders.com. That's where we sign up. And then the promotion code that you insert to get it for $89. In Omaha, if you don't have that code, it's 189 bucks, I think. But because we're hosting it, use that code and you get it for $89. Please sign up. If you need to get off work, take it off for vacation. Better yet, go in and tell your boss and say, listen, boss, I want to develop my leadership. I want to I become a better value 
to the company in which I serve, and I want to attend this conference, and maybe thinking about maybe the company could give me paid time to go to this conference <laughs> to better myself for this organization. You'd be shocked. You'd be shocked at how many businesses would say, how can we send other people? Because this is quality. So again, if you need more materials to take to work, share it with your boss or whatever, we have all of that. See uh, myself or call the church office and we will get that to you. Again, the Global Leadership Summit, August the 10th and 11th, we would love to see you there. Well, I am excited about the message this morning. Uh, I have the opportunity to preach today and next Sunday, and uh, we're going to have a little time together. And I'm excited about what God has given us to talk about. Now, listen, this is going to be a little different than normally when you go to church. Because normally when you go to church, a message is preached. You say, well, man, I'm, I hope John got that message. <laughs> or you say, man, I hope my kids were there to hear that. Or, honey, did you hear what the pastor said? Well, this morning, that's not the case. I have heard from God himself that this message is for you. you hear me? Don't, don't be trying to pass it off on somebody else. This message from God is for you. So you need to put on your listening ears, prepare your heart to hear what God has to say to me and to you this morning about the kingdom of God. Father, we prepare our hearts right now. God, we understand that you want to speak to us. So God, we decide right now that we want to listen. We want to hear what you have to say. And then God, we want to move out according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say amen. 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 Let's see what God has to say. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to have one verse this morning. One verse that God is going to speak to us about. And the title of the message is, Pay Attention How You Run. Pay attention how you run. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, now those of us who are students of the Word of God, whenever we read the word therefore, what is the question we ask? What is it there for? So we read this word therefore, so there's something that the writer of Hebrews has said prior to this in chapter 11, and now he's continuing that thought with the therefore. So we're going to go back and catch up on 11, but let's see what he wants to say. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run. Some of you said, man, it's been a long time since I ran. The writers encouraging the Hebrews, I want you to run. Church, this morning, God is telling you, I want you to run with endurance the race God has set before us. See, for each and every one of us here this morning, whether you are unsaved, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, or whether you are new to the kingdom of God, you're just getting familiar with this, this relationship with Jesus, or whether you're an old timer and you've been running this race a long time, God is telling us, this morning, I got a plan for your life and it is called a race. I want you to be involved in a race. And, and in this race, we're living out a life that is dedicated to him. We're living out a life that proclaims his victory. We're living out a life that at the end of our life, God will receive all the glory and the praise. It's a race. It's a race. Next week, we're going to talk about not tapping out in the race and talk about how Jesus is the author and the finisher and, and how everything we do, he models it so, so beautifully for us. So next week you want to be here, you want to come to hear that. But this morning we're going to talk about the race. God wants to describe to us the race. And in this race he has three, talking about the race, he has three things in this verse he wants us to be familiar with. The first is he wants us to be familiar with the witnesses. Say witnesses. Second, he wants to talk to us about the weight. Say weight. And then third, he wants to talk to us about the work. 
the witnesses, the weight, and the work. See, we're in a race, and in this race, it is not a sprint. It is a, it is a marathon. It is a long-distance race. It, is, it, 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 it takes endurance. It, it takes understanding that we're not in this thing for a short jaunt, but we're in this thing for a long period of time. And with that, there's a different mentality between running a sprint and running a long race. In a long race, you have to have an understanding that in this long race, there's going to be some pain. Man, I, 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 I hear these guys about running marathons and running 10Ks and, and, and all these different races. And I can just imar- imagine, because back in the military, I used to have to run a mile and a half. Man, let me tell you about the days of running a mile and a half. <laughs> but during these long races, there's, there's time in there where you get tired. You get worn out. You get distracted. You want to give up. You want to quit. Your body starts sending you signals. Why don't you just quit? Why don't you just quit? But marathon runners, long runners, they have a mentality that says, I'm going to finish the race. And this morning, God wants us to have the mentality of a marathon runner, not a sprinter. God wants to encourage us. And first, our encouragement in our, in our race comes from the therefore that we have witnesses. God has provided witnesses for us to encourage us along our race. See, these people in chapter 11 were men and women of faith, and God gave his stamp of approval on their lives by identifying them in the Hall of Fame of Faith in chapter 11. Not only did he just tell us their stories, but God says, you see these people? I am telling you, my stamp of approval is on how they ran their race. Now, you need to pay attention to that. You need to understand that because as we talk about the therefore of these people, it's going to relate to your race and mine. They are witnesses to us because God gave witness to them that he would not fail them. In each example that we're going to talk about, and we're not going to go through them all, God witnesses to that person's faith. That witness, God's witness was his divine approval. They are not witnessing what we are doing, which is normally what you think witnesses would be cheering us on or what we're doing. No, that's not God's intent. Rather, they are bearing witness to us that God can see you through the pain and the distance of your race. These witnesses in chapter 11 are witnessing to us that no matter who you are, no matter what your race looks like, no matter what it was in the past, no matter what you're going through now, no matter what's around that bend, no matter how many hurdles you have to launch over, God will see you through. That's the mentality of a marathon runner. When we look at the witnesses that are identified there, think about this. If you have a problem, let's say, with authority, and in your race, God has provided you some leaders in your life that really don't know much about leadership. Matter of fact, they stink, they're unsaved, they treat their employees very bad, and you're saying, God, why am I here? God will say, check out the witnesses. Check out the witnesses. You remember David? In David's race, he had a king that tried to kill him, but yet he got his seal of approval, David did, because no matter what his boss, no matter what king, the king Saul did, David honored him. See, in your race, there are going to be some people who are going to treat you unfairly, and they might have authority over you. And God is saying, you can do it. Don't give up. Don't quit. Some of you in your race, God has told you to do something. And you're excited about what God wants you to do. And you begin doing it. And your family and friends say, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why'd you, why'd you, why, why, are you, why are you moving here? Why are you doing that job? Why, why are you at that church? Why, why, are you, why are you acting that way? And they don't see it. They don't understand. And they're challenging you on what God told you to do because God didn't tell them. God told you. And there was a man 
by the name of Noah. Noah's out building a boat, and they said, Can you imagine? It's one thing when your neighbor's laughing at you, but then your family say, Dad. Can you, can you, kids, you remember how you say, Dad, put the hammer down. <laughs> Dad, please come in the house. Neighbors are laughing at us. No one knew what God said, but no one else understood. He witnessed to us that no matter what anybody else thinks, you can do what God told you to do. Some of you got brothers and sisters that you say, man, these people just don't get it. They hate you. They ridicule you. They talk about you. I, I mean, you would think that your relatives would be the people who would encourage you, but they don't. You remember Joseph? Man, they threw this brother in a hole, sold him into slavery. Those were his brothers. Some of you in your race you're looking at your family, and they just don't get it. And they're treating you mighty bad. God said, but I'm with you. I'm with you. See, these are all examples, witnesses, people who said, look at my life. God put his seal approval upon me, and you see things weren't that well with me. But yet, I trusted God. It's not just lifestyles, but it's character issues too with these guys. Think about it. Sarah and Abraham, they were old. Man, I'm talking about old. Some of us, we're old. I'm talking about old, and we got the mentality, well, I done done that. I done, I done finished my race. It, I mean, it don't look like I finished, but I done finished my race. I ain't doing nothing else. I'm sitting down. That's for young people to do. No, I ain't doing that. Jacob was a deceiver. Some of you, your history has been deception. And you say, well, why would God want to use somebody like me? Jacob was saying, because he used me. Some of you sexually, your history was disgusting. Not only what you did, but maybe what was done to you. And Rahab is screaming, look at me. Rahab saying, God used me and he can use you. Moses, Moses messed up continually, got angry, had a speech problem. I love people who say, well, God can't use me because I just can't talk. Moses said, look at me. God used me. He can use you. And then my favorite, my favorite of all, who encourages me, I mean, this brother really encourages me, David, a man after God's own heart. He was a murderer, an adulterer. A liar, and that's just what's documented. The brother probably had a whole lot of other stuff he did. <laughs> Reminds me of me. Sometimes I'm a liar, deceiver. I've been an adulterer. I, I haven't killed anybody, but the Bible says when you look at people with hate, it's just like murder. So I've killed a few people, I guess I'd say. <laughs> These are witnesses. Say witnesses. In your race, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you're doing, I don't care what the difficulties, I don't care how many hurdles, I don't care how many bends, I don't care how long, I don't care how many potholes, I don't care how many waters, stops, you got to jump. God says, run your race. The witnesses say, God is faithful. You ever heard someone say, well, Pastor Luca, I don't read the Old Testament. I just do the Psalms and Proverbs, but that Old Testament stuff, that's not for me. How are they going to know about the witnesses? One of the things that, that, that about church today that just disappoints me is how many of our young people don't learn the stories of the Old Testament. Man, I grew up on those stories. I wasn't saved. I was a long ways from being saved. But man, I knew about those old time, Old Testament brothers and sisters who served God. And now that I'm older, as I relate to their stories, they provide encouragement for me in my race. 
as I listen, as I read, as I study, it provides encouragement and endurance. Talking about the witnesses. Number two, not only do we have the witnesses, but we have the weights. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a crowd of witnesses to the faith, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. The writer says, listen, when you run a race, you got to strip off some stuff. You got to get rid of some stuff. You got to lighten yourself. You, you got to, how many of you ever seen somebody run a marathon and they were just heavy? I mean heavy. Some of y'all need to lighten your load. And I'm not just talking about physically, but I'm talking about in this case, he, the, the runners had a warm-up, and when they got ready to run, they would strip themselves of their warm-up. God is telling us in two ways we need to strip ourselves. He's talking about weights, which are encumbrances or hindrances, and number two, sin, which are entanglements. Sins, which are entanglements. Let's talk about those sins first. Sin will rob you of your vigor. Sin will rob you of, of God's glory. Sin will distract you from what God has called you to do. Sin will trip you up and keep you from running. Sin will injure you when it comes to running your race. And the writer here says, listen, get rid of those sinful entanglements, those things that trip you up because not that, 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 that God hates them but be, for, for the sake of them or hating them, but because they will keep you from what God has for you. Sin keeps you from what God has for you. This morning, we're going to look at two plants. And we're going to see how these two plants, the sundew and the Venus flytrap, how they give us a picture of how sin, say sin, how, how sin will trap us. And I want you to pay attention as we watch the, the small the clip. It's going to talk about the nectar. That sweet smelling nectar that draws you in and, and makes you feel good and, and causes all types of endorphins and, 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 and uh, stuff inside chemicals to flow and you get distracted from running because you're over here doing this. I want you to look at how these plants, God gives us a picture in these plants of what sin will do to us. Let's take a look. These carnivorous plants make light work of any insects that stray into their deadly clutches. The Cape Sundew, native to South Africa, lures ants and flies in with drops of sweet-smelling fluid on the highly adhesive tentacles that line its leaves. Surrounding tentacles then move further to ensnare the insect before glands on the leaf start to release digestive enzymes. A Venus flytrap leaf is divided into two halves, fringed with stiff spikes. Each plant carries three touch-sensitive hairs, and when two are touched in quick succession, the trap is triggered, imprisoning the fly. While these carnivorous plants are short on mercy, some fortunate creatures do live to fight another day. <laughs> Notice that, that each plant had this nectar that draws us in. And then when we don't know it, it snatches us. For many of us, we, we, we've been there. We've, we, we smell the sweet nectar. We, we found ourselves in a place that we should be in, and, and sin has zapped us. The writer says, if you're going to run, you've got to get rid of the sin. You've got you to lighten the load you, because it will trap you. It will trip you up. Now, what I want us to pay attention to 
is the intent of the writer, he's not saying, Hook, watch out for every sin because every sin is out to get you. No, he's talking about, Hook, those sins that are prone to you. See, when it comes to forgiveness, I got no problem. Man, you can do all kinds of stuff, say all kinds of stuff. I got no problem. I'm not worried. That nectar don't do nothing for me. I mean, evil stuff. I, I, I can forgive. But there are certain things like I got a lust problem with my eyes. So, so God is saying, Hook, when it comes to lust, you need to realize it's a trap for you. And although she's pretty and although she sounds good, before you know it, and you're going to be off track, you're going to be snatched out of the race, you're going to be distracted. What's your sin? What is your sin? What is that besetting sin in your life? You know what it is as I'm talking. You know exactly. Some of you might have struggled with it even today, this morning. What is that sin that the enemy is using against you, that sweet-smelling nectar that, 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 that he flaunts in your nose to get you so he can trap you? You know what it is? You got it? Everyone knows what it is? If, if you don't know what yours is, you, you just need to ask somebody who loves you and they can tell you what it is. Is it pride? Is it selfishness? Is it conceit? Is it covetousness? Is it unforgiveness? Is it jealousy? Envy? What is your besetting sin? Not what is mine. I told you what mine is. What is yours? See, God's talking to you about your race. Is it judgmental? Are you a critical, judgmental, harsh person? Are you indifferent, lazy, slothful person? What is your sin? What is it? What is it that you need to strip off? Second thing he said, not only do we have sins that are entanglements, but then he says we, we have these hindrances. We have these weights that are hindrances. Now, weights and hindrances are different than sins. Sin is sin, no matter who it is. Weights can be a sin for me and not be a sin for you. These, these are things that I have to choose to eliminate from my life, not because they are wrong in themselves, but because they are wrong for me. When I got saved, it was a few years after I graduated from college, and I, was a, I pledged a fraternity to Kappa. I love Kappa Alpha Psi. I love my brothers. Yeah, I loved everything about them. When I got saved, God said, you got to let that go. Not because they were bad, but because of my attitude, man. There was nothing, nothing, man. Those guys called. If, if Melba said, come over here, and they said, come over here, I might go over here. That was an, a, a weight for me. When it comes to pleasure, when it came to games, card games, and, and shooting pool, man, I could shoot pool and play cards from sunup to sundown and start over again. I loved it. There was nothing wrong with the card games. There was nothing wrong with shooting pool, but it was wrong for me because I hadn't learned balance. So as, in my walk with God, God has said, Hook, there's some things that you're going to have to get rid of if you're going to run light. If you're in for the long haul, you're going to have to let go of some stuff. That's right. That's right. Swimming pools. There's nothing wrong with swimming pools, but there's something wrong with them for me. <laughs> I got no business being there. When I go to Haiti, I have to go to the beach because that's part of it. Man, I'm struggling at the beach. When I was in the military, um, I had been stationed here for about four or five years, and I hated the cold. I hated the big coats. And then they sent me to Norfolk, Virginia for three months. And it was during the months of August, September, July, August, September. Man, you'd be in restaurants, and women would come in wearing swimming, swimming suits while I'm eating. Man, I couldn't wait to get back to Nebraska. I said, bring on the snow and the coats, Jesus. Bring on the snow and the coats. Because it was a weight for me. What's your weight? Come on, church. God's talking to me. What is it that you need to strip off because it's an, an, it's an encumbrance? 
It's a distraction. I want every head bowed and eye closed. I want you to think about it. Weights. Weights and sin. What are they? What are they? The Bible says if we confess our weights and sins to him, he will forgive us. So you, I want to run light. So I need to get rid. You know, one of the things, keep your heads bowed. One of the things with sin is it distracts you. You can't, you can't give your full energy to, to what God's called you to do because you're distracted with this sin stuff. So God is saying to you right now, I don't care what it is, let's strip it off. Let's strip it off. You know what it is. What's the sin? Things that the Word of God points out that are wrong. And what's the weight? That thing in your life. It could be a relationship. It could be an association. It could be a place that you go that God says you don't need to go there. There's nothing wrong with the place in itself, but it's wrong for you. Could be some attitudes. God is saying, I want you to get rid of it. It could be some type of entertainment. I don't want to beat up on Facebook and social media again, but some of you need to take a break. You need to, get, you need to, you need to relieve yourself of that distraction, of that weight. There's nothing wrong with social media. There's nothing wrong with Facebook. It's something wrong with you. Do you hear me? There's nothing wrong with Facebook. I hear people down in Facebook. There's nothing wrong with Facebook. There's something wrong with us. It's the users of Facebook. It's how we allow it. God is saying, you need to give that weight up. Could be some type of position, some honor that you receive, and, and you value that honor so much that it doesn't allow you to focus on what God's called you to. Father, right now, as your people, we confess our sin. Lord, we confess our rebellion, our iniquity, our transgression that has tripped us up from being, from running. And God, we say enough is enough. We want to finish your race. So Father, in accordance with your word, we agree with you and say it is sin, it is wrong, and we ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us, not only from the sin, but from those things that aren't sin, but are sin for us. Things that you've asked us to change in our life, but we haven't as of yet. God, forgive us. And then your word says, God, you will not only forgive us, but you will cleanse us. Thank you for your cleansing, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for lightening our load. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing back victory and valor to our race. God, thank you for, for giving us uh, blindfolds, God, that will allow us to focus on that which is important and not be like the flies and not be like the ants that are chasing after that nectar that's going to end up being our downfall. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have the witnesses that encourage us. We have those weights. We've taken care of the weights. And now the Word of God says it's the work. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that trips us up. Now listen to what he says. And let us run. Well, Pastor, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been doing this, this Jesus thing a long time. I don't need to run. That running is for young people. No, you need to run. Well, I'm, I'm just just taking a leisurely walk through this kingdom of God thing, man, and this God to tell me what he wants to do. No, you need to run. Now, it's not a physical attitude the way you walk. It's a mentality. It's a mentality that says, I am running a race. I'm not walking through the park. 
I am running a race. I'm not just going through the motions. I am running. You know, when a guy gets ready to run a race, they get ready to run a race. And when they're running a the race, they're not over here at the popcorn stand trying to decide that they want Mountain Dew or Do Dr. Pepper. <laughs> they're running the race. God says, I want you to run. I want you to run. I want you to have vitality. I want you to have a, a fervency that people who know you say, that brother's running for Jesus. That, that sister is on fire for the Lord. Hey, that brother, sister, they know what they're doing. They're about Jesus. First thing, we need to run. We need to run. We need to run. Run the race with endurance. We're going to run with fervency, and then we're going to run with endurance. You know what running with endurance means? It means I know and understand that there's going to be some potholes. I know and understand that my body, my flesh is going to get weak. I know and understand that everybody else is going to be watching, and I'm going to be running. I know that I need endurance. I need to build up my win. I need, to, I need to, to, to begin doing things that's going to help me run a little further. I need to develop myself. I need to have patience in this race. It's not about me tripping up today. It's about where am I going to be tomorrow. When I fall down, I'm running a race of endurance. I'm getting myself up. I'm brushing myself off and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready to go. Just like we just did in confessing our weights and sins. We're not sitting around saying, man, I feel bad about my weights and sins. Let me tell you about it. No, I done took care of that. God took care of that. I'm forgiven of it, and now I'm back in the race. And I'm running with patience. The patience. We need to run. We need to run. We need to have patience. Endurance. Running that race. For the Lord. And then thirdly, he says, the race God has set before us. The race, let me, let me, let me, let me change that a little bit so you get the context of what the writer is saying. The race that God is set before you. Well, Pastor Hooker, uh, you don't preach good as Andy Stanley. Well, that ain't my race. That's Andy's race. Well, Pastor Hooker, you, 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 don't, you, you, you don't preach like Pastor Hort. No, that's Pastor Hort's race. God didn't call me to be Pastor Hort. God called me to run my race. And some of us, we can't run our race because we work with, listen, if, if I'm, if, if this God, if, why is my story, I got all these, why is my race got all these hurdles in it? And this dude over here, man, he, he just going up through the motions because that ain't your race. Say, I got to run my race. Say it like you mean it. I got to run my race. <laughs> Young people coming up today have been raised in a Christian home. All they've known is Jesus all their life. 18, 19, 20 years old, and they're looking at their brothers and sisters struggling with sin. And, and they say, man, I've never had to struggle with that stuff. Man, I kind of wish I had a struggle. Lord, help me. You better run your race. You better run your race and not worry about what everybody else is struggling. Well, you know, I never, I never had, tempt, I was never tempted with boy. I, I, ne I never struggled with, I, was, I didn't gamble. I, 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 man, I just, why come I never had that? You better run your race. Well, I, I, I've been married 20 years, and, and this dude here, he is worthless, Lord Jesus. And this sister over here, she ain't, she ain't serving God, and, and she got this good man. You better run your race. Well, I, I've been divorced, and, and, and I don't know how God, I mean, how can God use me? And, and these other people over here, been, I mean, when they do these weddings, and they talk about people married 40, 50, 60, I just feel, sister, you better run your race. It's your race. Wait a minute, Pastor Hooker. I understand this, but let me tell you something. 
You got these three kids that are like angels, and I got these three hellions. It ain't fair. How am I going to run? Man, I'm so distracted. I mean, these kids are wearing me out. I don't know what I'm going to do. You better run your race. I remember when I had hellions. Any of them here? (laughs) Hey, there you go. I see you up there. I got an amen. I got an amen up in the gallery there. God knows I had to run my race. And we're comparing ourselves and, and looking at what other people had to go through and what they didn't have to go through. And it distracts us. He says, and let us run our race. Well, I graduated from high school, and, and, and my friend, he got to go to massive commission, and, and I can't afford massive commission. And, and God, that ain't fair. You better run your race. Well, come on, come on, come on now, Lord. You know that I, I'm, I'm working in this job, and I've been here 20 years, and the people I work with, they just don't love Jesus. They don't want to have nothing to do with Jesus. And this dude over here, he's working. I mean, they, they, they do devotions in the morning before they go to work. You better run your race. You better run your race. You better run your race with endurance. God is telling us this morning, it's not about anybody else's race. It's not about anybody else's relationship. It's about you and him. Stand to our feet. In 1981, there was a race in Omaha called the Pepsi Challenge. And in the Pepsi Challenge, there were 1,200 runners of this 10K. And there was this young man by the name of Bill Broadhurst who wanted to run. But what was strange about Bill was that 10 years earlier, he had had an aneurysm, and during the surgery, he became paralyzed on his left side. So he had signed up, he was in the group, and he was ready to run this 10K. And when the gun went off, All 1,200 runners took off, but there was Bill. With his paralyzed left side, he started step, drag, step, drag. And as he got room, because all the other runners passed him by, soon, about half mile, he couldn't see anybody else. They were all gone. But Bill, mile two, step drag, step drag, sweat pouring from his head. Those who were left bystanders, just watch Bill, just going mile three, pain riveting through his body, sweat pouring off him, this, this, this hard, painful look on his face, step drag, step drag, no other runners in sight, step drag, mile four, step drag, mile five. Step, drag, and it came mile 6.2. Two hours, 29 minutes later, Bill crossed the finish line, agonizing pain. Only a few people left as he crossed the line. About ready to collapse, he looked up and there was this one man coming toward him and he could recognize the man. It's someone that he had seen, and, and it was Bill Rogers, a world-class marathon runner. And as Bill was gathering himself, Bill Rogers came up, and he took from around his neck the award for coming in first place in the same race that Bill was in. And he took that award, and he put it on Bill's neck. And he looked at Bill. And he says, you deserve this much more than I did because you worked a lot harder than I did. And our races are kind of like that. Your race might not look like anybody else's race. Everybody else's race might, might be long past yours. Everybody else's race might be smooth sailing. Everybody else might, might not have the potholes and the hurdles that you have. But God says to us today, run your race. 
Run your race. Run your race. Run your race. With fervency, with, with determination, getting rid of, of sin and, and weights that, that entangle and, and, and encumbrances and say, God, I'm going to work. I'm going to run. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be bothered. Thank you for the witnesses that encourage my heart and let me know by faith, God, you're with me. God, I'm going to run my race. 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 People are going to criticize. People are going to judge. People are not going to understand. Run your race. Run your race. And know that your Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, waits to say, well done my good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you tripped. Yeah, I know you fell. Yeah, I know you got distracted. Yeah, I know you compared, but you finished your race. Finish 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 your race. Father, I'm praying for a room full of marathon runners today. God, I'm praying for men and women, young and old, who've heard your word to them today. And God, they're saying, God, I'm going to finish my race. Not because of what I can do, God, but because of what you have proven that you will do for me. God, today I join with you. I partner with you. Because I know it's not just about me finishing, but it's about the lives that are going to be touched as I run my race. It's about my family. It's about my co-workers. It's about, it's about people I meet on the street. It's about people I meet in the gym. It's about my enemies. It's about those that despitefully use me. It's about those who curse me. It's about those who hate me. God, when I run my race, I'm winning them for you. God, I'm going to run my race. God, we're going to run our race. God, I'm going to run my race. For the glory of God, I'm going to run my race. Next week, we're going to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured, and he didn't tap out. He didn't tap out. He didn't quit on you. He didn't quit on you. He didn't quit on me. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a round of applause and thank Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we do this? On your way out of this week, you know some people who their race is rough. Their race is hard. Can you just give them some encouragement? As you're leaving today, you might know someone, they're going through a rough time. Encourage them with these words. Run your race. Tell them to run their race. God bless you. Have a great day.